Well, today is a, a special day for us as a church. We're, we're actually a really, really simple church uh, that's based upon one simple principle, and it's this, that the Word of God does the work of God. The Word of God does the work of God. So from the beginning of our church, from the, from the day that we've started in 2005 in my apartment at the time in Pacific Beach, uh, our normal practice has been simply to read through and study the books of the Bible and have God do his work among us through his word. Uh, we believe that Jesus is our head pastor, and there's six of us pastors that serve under him, and we believe that Jesus leads us by his written word, by the Bible. And so we read it, we, we preach from it, our kids learn from it. You may not know this, but, but the kids who go into our kids, they're learning a version of the exact same text that the adults are here in this room right now. And then we talk about it during the week in our community groups. And in the 13 years that we have been a church, pretty special day that today we're going to finish our ninth book of the Bible. Isn't that cool? We've gone through the book of Romans, the book of Nehemiah, the book of Matthew, the book of Jonah, the book of Titus, the book of Acts, the book of Genesis, the book of Galatians, and now today we finish Luke. It's been about a year and a half journey, and uh, pretty incredible, and um, some of you have been here for parts of it, some of you have been here for uh, more, for most of it, but there's one person here in the room who has been here for, for every single book, every Every single series, every text, and every, every sermon that, that, I, that I've preached in the 13 years of this church. And I want to honor her today for putting up with listening to me talk a lot. And that is my wonderful wife, Amy. So uh, just thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll let you in a little ticket. Pretty much every Sunday after I get home, I'll, I'll be like, hey, babe, so, so how, is my, how is my sermon? <laughs> And she'll say, like, one of, one of two things, uh, and she'll be like, it was good. And she'll be like, eh. And, 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 and she'll smile this sweet little gracious laugh. And, you know, in all seriousness, it, it, it's, it takes a lot. It's a unique role that, that my wife is in and being a preacher's wife. And so I'm extremely grateful for you, Amy, for your love and support of me and your dedication to learning from, from God's word. You're a wonderful woman of God. Um, so this is a... The last sermon in Luke, and it's the scene where, where Jesus sends his disciples and, and all future disciples, that includes us, to go out into the world and tell people about who he is and, and what he has done. So in light of that, I titled my sermon today, The Story We Tell. And I know you just sat down, but why don't you go ahead and stand again in honor of Luke's words being God's words given to us. I'll read the text, acknowledge it as such, pray over it, and, and we'll get into it. So we're in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. Then he, Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, lifting up his hands, he blessed them, and while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray real quick over our time in the word. Jesus, would you do what you did for these disciples and opens our minds to understand the scriptures and to see you in and through them. And I pray that through this text you would also excite us to your mission with a passion to tell other people about you because you are so, so good. And I pray these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. The story we tell. You might not know this, some of you, you do, but there's a couple of guys in our church who actually host and, and run a pretty popular podcast called Dude, Did You Hear? Um, they say that the best stories always start out with that phrase in, in our day and age, Dude, Did You Hear? And uh, I'll give you an example. I was listening to their most recent podcast this week, and one of the top stories was, Dude, did you hear where Nickelodeon got its name from? It's breaking, breaking news. Uh, 
Apparently back in like 1905 or something, it cost like a, a quarter to go to the theater. But there were, there were these cheap, uh, crappy theaters that you could go to for a nickel. And, and, so, and then Odeon is the Greek name for theater. So Nickelodeon is a, a cheap, crappy theater, um, which is, I think, why most of their TV shows have been worthless. Like... <laughs> SpongeBob, Rugrats, Ren and Stimpy, you know, they're just not any good, you know. Um, so, yeah, really important story that you wanted to hear about, right? Um, what we have today in our text is it's Jesus, his own summary of his own life and what he expects all who hear about it to do. And I got three points for us today to, to walk through in it. God above us, God for us, and God with us. And, and the one take home action step for you is you got to tell the story. You got to tell the story. So let's jump into this first point, God above us. This is the fourth time in Luke that he records Jesus showing himself to people after he rose from the dead. And this one, I think, is by far the most powerful scene. Uh, it's after he allowed them to, to touch his body and see that it was, it was really him. And it's after they eat a meal together. And after the meal, they're, they're sitting down and, and Jesus just opens up the Bible and their minds for one final teaching. He does the same thing with his disciples that he did with the, the two men on the road to Emmaus that we looked at last week in Luke. And he takes them through the scriptures, the, which means the holy writings of God through the hands of guys like Moses the prophet and David of the Psalms and explains how everything in the Bible is written about him. That's why in verse 40 he says, everything that was written about me. He gets a little more specific just what about him that the Bible is actually pointing to. He says in verse 46 and 47 that it was written that the Christ should suffer and then on the third day rise and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name. I want us to focus for a few minutes on the first part of, of, the, uh, of that, on just one word, actually, that, that one word there, should. See so that word should? Uh, the, and uh, it's important here. This is a verbal noun, which is in the infinitive form, which means that the way that you translate it is should suffer, or must suffer, or nece necessarily suffer. That's kind of how Jesus said it back in verse 26 to Cleopas and likely Luke, he says, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer? Here's why I'm, I'm bringing this up. Last week I made this point that, that, that sound doctrine, good right, and right theology, the right way of understanding the Bible, and many times is built upon grammar, understanding grammar. The gospel itself is built on grammar. This is a good example of it because that one word should or necessary, it conveys something very important, conveys that there was a plan and an order to history. Uh, it conveys that there were certain things that had to happen. It conveys that from the beginning, from the very beginning, from the, from the first book of Genesis to the first five books written by, by Moses, all throughout all the, the books of the prophets and, and the Psalms, that God, was, he was doing something, that he was setting something up in order to do something that would result in, in many, many people being rescued and saved. The very first one happens in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, when they, they sin and they rebel against God, unleashing these devastating effects upon humanity in the land with sin, sorrow, and suffering. And, and God first he speaks to, to Satan, the serpent who, who tempted Eve and, and Adam. And, and he says, one day from the offspring of the woman, a, a seed will, will come and he will save Humanity, by crushing the snake, but before he crushes the snake, he's, he's, he's going to be bruised. He's going to be bruised. Jesus is the Messiah who was bruised on the cross, but then rose and crushed the snake. Later on, God raises up this guy named Moses who leads this deliverance of God's people out of slavery. And then God promises an even greater deliverer to come and save people out of slavery to sin and death once and for all, and so he has Moses set up this, this whole sacrificial system where, where once a year the, the priest, the pastor of the day, would take this perfect spotless lamb and the lamb would suffer and die on behalf of and in place of the people so they could be forgiven and freed. And, and Jesus is our perfect spotless lamb who was sacrificed in the place of and for sinners to deliver us from sin and death. Later on, a prophet named Isaiah comes along and God has him write these words about Christ the Savior who would suffer from Isaiah chapter 53, verses four through seven. 
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter. And like a sheep before it shears the silence, so he opened not his mouth. Uh, after a while, Moses, after, after Moses, after him, a while later, God raises up this guy named David, makes him a king. David ends up writing a bunch of songs for church that get put together in one book in the Bible called the, the Psalms. And several of them talk about this greater king who would come and suffer and die for his people. Here's part of one of them from Psalm chapter 22. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My, my strength is dried up like a pot. Sort of my tongue sticks to my mouth. You lay upon me the dust of death. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them from my clothing. They cast lots. <laughs> Jesus is the king who is pierced his hands and feet for us and they, they stared at him up there and they gloated over him and they cast lots for his clothing. Hmm. So what Jesus is saying in our pas- passage in, in Luke is, hey look guys, all this stuff that was written, like what we just read in Isaiah, like what we just read in, in Psalm 20, this is talking about me. This is all about me and what I, what I did on, on the cross. I had to suffer according to God's plan. This was planned. Ephesians chapter 1 in the Bible explains the plan this way. It says, in love he predestined us for adoption. I think we can put it up there. There it is. As sons and daughters through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. They decided this, the Father and Son, before the foundation of the world. Uh, this is what Jesus is saying. This was the plan all along. This was the plan. The, the Son, God the Son, and God the Father concocted for the foundation of the world and how they would save humanity and show men and women the, the goodness of God and the greatness of God and the love of God. I titled this sermon point, God Above Us, because the story that, that we tell, the first part of the story is simply, there is a God. There is a God above us. There is meaning and purpose to life. Everything that's happened in history and everything that's happened in your life is not meaningless and pointless. There is a God who is over all and above all, over it all. There was and there is a plan. In the last section of Luke, we've returned to the theme of story that we first started out with the first sermons at the beginning of Luke. What many have recognized is that both the, the story of our lives and the, the story of God, really the story of the Bible, is a story of, of four things. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Think about your own life. Each one of us has a, a story of creation. When and where we were born and what our life was like growing up and all the things that have made us who we have become. We were all created and we've all created a certain kind of life for ourselves. Then in each of our lives there's a, there's a story of fall where things have not worked out and gone right as it were the way that we wanted them to or thought that they, they should or would where we've maybe failed or, or where others have failed us and hurt us or where we realize that we're not as great as we thought we were or that life isn't that great and is really hard. Maybe we start out kind of optimistic, but then the older you get, you realize huh, life is hard. Then out of that, in the story of Paul, each one of us turn to redemption. It's where and how we're working to try to find relief or somehow to make our lives better try to fix what's gone wrong, or hopefully bring us to a greater sense of happiness. And so then we pour our heart and our time and our energy into whatever that thing is, looking for redemption. 
Then each one of us has a certain restoration that we would like. It's where our, our goals and what we're hoping to, to get to are finally achieved. Where, where, where what life looks like if we were successful and got where we wanted to be from seeking redemption. Imagine the life that we, we want when it would be good and what it would be. It's our restoration. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Each one of our lives follow this plot line. And the Bible follows the same plot line, only on a, on a grand scale. God created all of life, all human life. He is the creator. But there was a fall. Man and, and woman, the heads of the humanity, they, they fell, rejected God, and resulted in a mess for the human race and for the land. Despite the fall, God loved mankind anyway, and so he sent a Redeemer to save them, to make things right. And this Redeemer does the work that none of us have been able to do. We all have failed. He, he doesn't fail. doesn't fall. He lives perfectly and then gives up his life as a payment for everyone else's faults in order to bring them back to God. And then the result is redemption. First, the redemption of the heart, a restoration of, of the heart, relationship with God, and then ultimately a full body restoration provided for by the Redeemer who rose from the dead to redeem even our bodies. And he waits now in heaven for the day when all of his friends and, and family come home to be with him. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. It's the story of life. This is what Jesus was talking about when he said that the Christ had to suffer. This was, this was God's plan. There's a God over and above us who, who sees us, he sees you, he cares for you, and he has a plan to redeem and to restore life, to restore our lives. And, it, and, and it's a far better plan than any of our plans, better than anyone that we could accomplish, could accomplish on our own. So I'm just curious how that hits you guys, you know. When you think about your life, do, do you see those benchmarks? You see your story of creation, some key things that have happened, and your family growing up that have made you the way you are, your fall, where, where you failed or others have failed you and it's brought wounds, deep wounds, your redemption, how you've been trying to, to get past that and to make things right, restoration, what you're hoping for, what the good life is that you want. It's a little kind of eerie, isn't it, to think about our lives that way. Maybe, maybe you're here today and what you need to hear simply is just, there is a God. There is a God who, who sees you. There is a God who cares for you. He's there and he's working. He's got a plan. Just look to him. The story we tell and the story that we got to tell is that there is a God. There is a God above us who cares and has a plan and that his creation, fall, redemption, and restoration story is it's a far better one than the one that we've been working on. For our next point, I'd like us to jump into God for us to see why his plan is actually better. God's plan was and is, really simple, Jesus. God's plan was and is Jesus. Why his plan is better is simply because through Jesus, verse 47 says, we can have redemption and forgiveness. Redemption and forgiveness of sins is possible through him. So let's talk about these, these two things. Um, Repentance is kind of like just this fancy Christian word that really just means change. It's change. And, and change, is, change is hard, isn't it? Um, how, many, how many of you in here are like into working out, like you work out? Yeah? See, fair number of you. All right. Some of you do, you're into sports, and so you just kind of get exercised by, by that way. And uh, most people that are into health and, and fitness... Um, they're in, they're in it at some level because they're trying to take care of or to change their body. You might not actually know this is kind of a fun side note, but the global fitness and, and health industry is the single biggest market worldwide, both in revenue and members of, of health and fitness clubs. generates in the U.S. more than $80 billion a year. Pretty crazy, huh? Um, now, the funny thing about health and fitness is that change is really hard. Um, so this is... This is kind of a bit embarrassing, but whatever. Um, I turn 40 next month, and so I, uh, yeah, thank you. I guess I won't be a young man anymore, but I still got that baby face, so I'm like, I look about 10 years less than I am. 
Um, now, I don't know why, but I just decided that, you know, I'm turning 40. I'm going to get in the best shape of my life um, for 40. And so I have had this goal that I've been working on for the better part of a year to get abs by August. Um, that has, uh, I, and, whew, I mean, it's been brutal. I've gone all out. I've done the, the Schwarzenegger blueprint for build, the Schwarzenegger blueprint for cut. I have now signed up for bodybuilding.com. I'm doing workout plans on that. I have cut out like anything good like burgers and butter. I pretty much just eat like egg whites and like chicken breast and protein shakes. I mean, I'm at the gym six days a week. I was there this morning. There's nobody there on Sunday morning, by the way, if you want an empty gym. Uh, but man... I can kind of faintly see the top of my first four abs. But August is coming. It's crunch time, man. Uh, which, which, by the way, in all seriousness, um, I think we need to think biblically about everything. And I've, and I've actually done some, some work on, on eating and health from, from the Bible, both overeating, undereating, fitness, and all that. And if, if you'd like some more on that, um, you can just text this number on the screen and uh, text body to that. And uh, I'll just kind of send you a little bit of a biblical perspective on, on the human body so you can check, check that out. Now, the reason why I bring up this embarrassing story about me wanting abs is that change is really, really, really hard. It's really hard. Sometimes, I mean, think past just, trying to change your body, trying, like life. Changing life is hard. It's hard for companies to change once they're like up and running. Like if they can't change and adapt like Blockbuster, then they die. Um, and that's why we have Redbox now and all that. Uh, change is really hard in marriage, right? Uh, if any of you been married for any length of, of time, um, you ever been where you kind of find yourself in the same arguments and fights over and over again. Um, change is hard. Change is hard with God, walking with God. Ever found yourself just kind of battling the same stuff over and over again? And you just kind of, just, you're just getting stuck in these repeat cycles and scenarios that you just can't seem to break out of. Sound familiar? Change is hard. What Jesus says is through his life, death, and resurrection, real lasting change is actually possible. We can't, we can't beat sin no matter how hard we try. Like, that's not going to happen until we die or Jesus comes back. We can't stop other people from sinning against us, hurting us, no matter how hard we try to protect ourselves from it. But Jesus, unlike us, he was able to resist ever sinning, never even once failing. And then he died on the cross, absorbing all of our sin, absorbing it into his own body, absorbing the, absorbing the wrath of God for the sin placed on him. So what happens for the, the believer in Christ is that he comes to us for us to help us, to help us overcome our sinful patterns and behaviors and tendencies, and then he enables us to absorb the, the sins and the hurt that's inflicted upon us by others. See, God's plan in sending Christ was to send one who would be for us, to help us, and to, to enable us to succeed. I'll give you a couple different passages that show this. Philippians 4, 13 says it just really generally. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Uh, with Christ, you can do it. On your own? Eh, likely not. We receive strength from Jesus who enables us to do what we could not do on our own. Galatians chapter 2, 20, it connects the dots specifically for us to Jesus and his work. It says, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. With Jesus in our lives, we know that we are loved. We are know that we are loved and that God is for us. He is for us no matter what. So often I think uh, we tend to think that, that God is against us, that he's just so displeased with us that he's rolling his eyes at us. You know, we tend to think that he's against our, our goals and our hopes and, and dreams and like if we just really followed him then we'd all become pastors, you know. Like, I, I just, I think 
that's really bogus. Um, he's the one who, who gives us certain passions and desires. He, he made us each unique in his own image. We have all have different fingerprints and facial complexions and internal gifts and talents that he's given us. See, he's given us all the things. I think the problem is our tendency is we, we tend to cut him out of our, our goals and hopes and dreams and, and desires instead of having him be a big part of it. The way not to cut him out is to see that God is for us and he is behind us. God wants us to succeed. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to become the best version of yourself. That's why he gave his son. Because through him, it actually becomes possible. to Become the true you, the real you, the better you, the you that's you in Christ with him. Real change. Real repentance. It becomes a reality for us. So that's why, that's repentance, that change through Christ is actually achievable. You can change. Maybe you're here today and you just simply need to, to hear that. Like, you can change. It might be a lot of hard work, but with Christ you can do it. You can change. Change can happen for you because Christ is for you. The other reason Jesus gives on why God's plan is better is this forgiveness of sin thing. Forgiveness like change is hard. Actually, I would say without Christ, it's, it's impossible. Uh, I was going to say probably impossible, but it just is impossible. Forgiveness, just real simple, it's, it's giving something to someone in order to make something better. So for, you give for, forgiveness. It's an interrelational thing. Like, you know, you can't have forgiveness with a rock. Like, it's got to be another human being. It takes two or more people. Typically, for forgiveness to happen, um, some, someone has to pay for the grievance that was made. You can, you can choose not to forgive and you make somebody else pay uh, for their sin. And you can do this, you know, by getting back at them some way. You can, you know, you could sue them. You could, you know, not talk to them. You could just cut them out of your life. Uh, you can talk trash about them behind their back. Or you can make yourself pay. So one of one of the two parties is always going to pay. If you make yourself pay, you, you beat yourself up, you fret or stress, you replay conversations in your head, you're just feeling hurt and angry, you're wallowing in it. Um, regardless, somebody else, regardless, someone pays. But here's the thing. I've been thinking about this one quite a bit. I think that even when we try to make somebody else pay, you still pay uh, deep down. We always tend to make ourselves pay in some way. And, and I think that the ways that it comes out is in feelings of fear, guilt, and shame. Ultimately, if something goes down, um, even if it isn't just a single event, if it's just the overriding thing in life, one of these three things is going on. Um, I believe it's because when we get disconnected from, from God, what happens is that then we just feed these, we either feed the fear or feed the guilt or feed the shame. It's, it's fear. We're fearful about life for the future. Like, is it going to go right? Is everything going to fall apart? And where will I be? Or, or fearful of God, what he's going to do. If it's shame, we just feel that we're, we're terrible, broken people, that there's, there's no hope for, for us. And when it comes down to it, I'm probably not even lovable by anyone. No one would really want to love me, especially God. If it's guilt, we're just racked with the feelings that we've done wrong. You you replay those conversations in your head and you just feel really bad about yourself. You feel bad toward God. You don't measure up. The problem is that what happens when we feed into fear, guilt, or shame, we, we just get stuck into this loop. This loop of trying to get forgiveness, trying to get forgiveness of sins, but the, in the process we just keep more and more upon ourselves. So how do you, how do you get out of it? I think the only way is Jesus. Because what Jesus does is he comes along and he offers to take it for us. He offers to be the one that pays. He offers to pay the price for us instead of making us pay it. He takes on the fear. He says, look, I already died. I already suffered. <laughs> and I rose. So there's nothing. There's nothing that can really hurt you. Because you're going to rise too. You will be okay takes on the shame and says, hey, look, this is why I came. I, I knew all the stuff that was going to happen in, in your life, but me and the Father before the foundation of the world, we made a plan because we love you and you're valuable to God. 
You need to know that today. You are valuable to God. You have worth in his eyes. And then he offers to take the guilt and says, look, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pay the price for that guilt on the cross. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die for that. I'm going to suffer for it uh, so that you don't have to make yourself pay. <laughs> forgiveness is a powerful thing. Somebody asked me recently, is, is forgiveness really real, Dwayne? And I started telling me some stories of stuff in their life, and, and they were like, hey, could, I, could I really be forgiven of this? And I said, yeah, like you're forgiven. They said, well, what about this? Yeah, you're, you're forgiven of that. You can be forgiven of that too. And, and I said, look, man, there's, there's, no, there's no sin too big, and, and there's no sin that you could just commit too many times that God could not and would not and will not forgive you. So I realized, like, yeah, you're forgiven. So let me hear it again. You're forgiven. One more time. You are forgiven. Mm. The tears start well up inside. And so that's amazing that we can be forgiven. Mm. Maybe you're here today and that's just what you need to hear. That you're, you're forgiven. You don't need to carry it anymore. <laughs> Jesus carried it for you. He absorbed it for you. You don't need to make yourself pay. You're worth it to God. There's nothing to be afraid of. The chief way that we know God is for us is because he forgives us through Jesus. That's what the Bible says. Real simple. 1 John 1, 7 and 9 says, The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. All. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just all the time, every time, to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's what we want. We're going to be cleansed of all that junk and be freed from it, forgiven and whole. Through Jesus, repentance and forgiveness actually becomes possible. And I think, I think they're kind of like the two of the things that we long for most in life. This is a story that we tell. How, how good God is to us in Jesus. He gives repentance and forgiveness to us. We've got to tell people that change and forgiveness is possible. We've got to tell the story. Let's move on to our final point for today, God with us. This is the, uh, it's the very end of the story, and it's just, it's epic. It's cool. I think it's probably the coolest scene in the Bible. Jesus, you know, he, they go out for a walk with the disciples after dinner and talking, and and then he says a few last words, and, and he puts his hands out, praying for the disciples, and then he just starts to levitate, <laughs> like, up in the sky. I walked up, this isn't in my sermon, but just to be fun, I mean, it's a true story, you can ask my wife. I walked up with these guys at a mall, once a bunch of these, like, gangster thugs, and, and I was like, hey, like, I believe that Jesus, he floated up into the sky, into heaven, and that one day he's going to come back the same way. You guys want to hear about it for a second? And they're like, Sure. And so I just gave them all the gospel. I'm like, what do you guys think? And I was like, you want to pray to receive Jesus? And they all, one guy nods his head, and the next guy nods his head. We all like held hands in a circle in the middle of the wall, and I, mall, and I led all these guys to Christ. Um, so it's good. Just tell people Jesus floats. Like, it's a good evangelistic tool. Um, so you've got to imagine this scene, though. Like, I was trying to think about it. Like, I know we've got one on stained glass thing on the wall. You guys ever seen pictures or actually been to see the Cristo Rey in Brazil? Uh, I haven't been to the one in Brazil. Um, that's the Brazil one. I've been to the one in Portugal. Like, his uh, feet are, like, you know, way taller than me, you know, like three stories, just this feet. Um, but then my favorite Jesus floating uh, statue is actually just a little bit south of Rosarito, um, and it's because, um, that's, that's him right there, and it's because what he's looking out at is um, a really good surf spot. Um, and so if you see the next slide, right there to his right hand, you see that right? There's a really good wave that comes there, and I love surfing with Jesus at that spot. It's really, really good. Surfing Jesus is epic. So uh, you got to imagine just the scene. I mean, all throughout Jesus' ministry, people are constantly asking Jesus for some sign to like prove he's really from God. And he never really like gives it. He's like, well, believe my words. If, I, if you don't believe my words, you're not going to believe anything else. And then he does miracles anyway. They don't believe the miracles. 
But here, at the very, very end, the final scene of his life on earth, he gives it. I mean, he just starts floating up into the sky. And you're like, oh, crap. Okay. Uh, now, Christians, for hundreds of years, they have called this the ascension. The ascension. Jesus descended from his divine throne as God to take on human flesh, to add it to himself, becoming a little baby. And when he does, angels worship him with great joy. That's where the beginning of Luke starts out. Here at the end now, Jesus ascends into heaven, taking human flesh into heaven for the very first time. And now his disciples worship him with great joy. This is where the book ends. Jesus' ascension is a, 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 it's really important for us to understand that there's a connection with Jesus' ascension and the mission that he hands off to the disciples, which include all who believe in him afterward, which is us as well. So there's this essential connection between ascension and mission. The ascension is him handing off his work to his followers. I mean, he literally lifts up his hands and hands it off. It's like, here you go, now it's yours, now you go do it. Four writers in the Bible wrote, wrote about Jesus' last words before his ascension. They all record a, a different piece of what Jesus said uh, was going on, and they're all about missions. So here's the one from Matthew chapter 28. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you even to the end of the age. Mark 16, 15, he remembers him saying, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. John 21, 17, real simply, he says, feed my sheep, feed the sheep. Uh, give him what I gave him. What Luke accounts of him saying is his work of repentance and forgiveness in his name, that it should be proclaimed. And then he says that you are witnesses of these things, and I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you who will clothe you with power. Jesus is to be proclaimed. We are to proclaim what we have witnessed. Now, by the way, as far as I've, no, none of us here have physically seen Jesus with our eyes. But what we have witnessed is the same thing that the disciples witnessed. Because remember, we, we read it. Jesus rooted and pointed their understanding of him where? In the scriptures. In the scriptures. That's what they witnessed. Him in the scriptures. So both the original disciples and disciples today, what we are to proclaim to others in his name is what we've witnessed, what we've read and seen about Jesus in the Bible. And that's what the original disciples did. They, they, they went and they started preaching and teaching, and they would always do it from the Bible. They'd always use the Bible, how the Bible pointed to Jesus. And that's what we're still doing today, going through books of the Bible. We've, you know, there's 66 different books, and we finished nine today, so uh, we got like, what is that? Uh, who's good at math? Like, 57 more to go? Like, maybe we can do it before I die? That would be cool. Um, all the accounts have believers and followers of Jesus that they're to go out and tell other people with words about Jesus. What you, Luke uniquely points out is how we're able to do that and how we're supposed to do that. And, and what he explains is that it's about this promise of the Father, this promise of power from the Father, being clothed with power. Now, Jesus talked a lot about and, and prayed to God as Father, but he talked just as much about the Holy Spirit. We call the Holy Spirit the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is, is kind of active all over the place. You just kind of He's just kind of subtle and you don't notice him. He's, he's kind of there anytime anything cool is going down, like Jesus being baptized, come down in the form of a dove. The Bible says he's the one that actually raises Jesus from the dead. He's the one who wrote the Bible. Like, Holy Spirit's there at the beginning of creation, hovering over the waters when God creates. Holy Spirit's just cool. Uh, so after Jesus ascended, Luke wrote another book of the Bible um, after the church starts called the book of Acts. Most people think it stands for the Acts of the Holy Spirit in and through the church, through Jesus' church. At the beginning of the book of Acts, Luke, he retells the story of Jesus' ascension, and he includes a few more details. Acts 1, 8, and 9, he remembers Jesus' words saying, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you'll be my witnesses. So the, the Holy Spirit is power for witness about Jesus. Real simple. The Holy Spirit is power for witness. 
And like Jesus said, he promised to send the Spirit. Uh, he said this in John 16, 7. I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. If I go, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to you. Super important for us. So Jesus is ascending into heaven. He's levitating up into the sky. And he, his final words are about a final gift to us, to help us. The sending of his very spirit upon his followers. When, when, you, when you're reading the Bible, the whole Bible, there's, there's places here and there where the Holy Spirit comes upon a specific individual for a temporary amount of time for some specific task, and then the Holy Spirit withdraws from the person. But what, what Jesus promised and what the prophets promised is, as well is that a time would come when the Holy Spirit would come upon men and, and women, and it would be a permanent gift. Um, Jesus says, for all who put faith in him. And that's why Jesus said it was better. By ascending and sending his spirit, he can be with multiple people in multiple places at the same time all over the globe. So much so that he said, like Matthew, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And this is what we as Christians believe, that we have the Holy Spirit of God. If you're a Christian, you have the spirit. Uh, 2 Timothy 1 14 says it real clear. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. That's 2 Timothy 1.14. Real clear. 1 Corinthians 12.13. In one spirit we are all baptized. There's one spirit. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. Now there are tons of benefits to having the Spirit. The Spirit's the one who helped the 40 different authors of the Bible write the Bible. The Spirit's the one who opens the Bible, enabling us to understand how it points to Jesus. The Spirit is the one that convicts us of, of sin, you know, and helps us know when we're not following God. The Spirit's the one that comforts us when we're down. The Spirit's the one that helps us hang on when we feel like giving up. Uh, the Spirit does all kinds of things for us. And one of the most important things the Bible talks about is the Holy Spirit gives us power for mission to tell other people about Jesus. Um, one of the, the main things the Spirit wants to do in and through you, in your life is to help you tell other people about Jesus. You don't have to have all the right answers. Jesus says, hey, it's just about saying his name. <laughs> just bringing up the name of Jesus and you see what happens. Um, I mean, that can even just be asking other people, hey, what do you think about Jesus? I'm curious to know your thoughts. Sometimes I think we, we, like, we want to plan too much and think, oh, man, I... Can't bring up Jesus because, you know, I might not have all the right answers that somebody asked. And I got to get my theology like every I dotted and T crossed before I would ever have a conversation with somebody about Jesus. Like, I, I, I just don't think that's true. Think about this. Think about it this way. Uh, what is the greatest gift of, of God? Uh, I mean, is it the Bible? Like, helping us to understand that the Bible's true? Um, I mean, is it the cross? Jesus dying on the cross? And those are both, those are big things. I don't think either one of them is, is the greatest gift. Both of them are a, a means to them. I mean, a means to an end. The Bible's a great, great gift, but if it doesn't do anything in us, it's, it's meant to do something in us. The cross is a great gift, but it's, it's meant to do something in us. The means to an end. The greatest gift is the result. It's that we get Jesus. <laughs> that we get Jesus himself. The Bible points to Jesus. That the cross enables us to receive Jesus. The biggest gift of God is the presence of Jesus in our lives. The greatest gift of God is the presence of Jesus. His Holy Spirit living with us and, and in us. Sometimes because of that, I think that the, one of the biggest things that, that non-Christians, people who have not yet become Christians and believe in Jesus, they just need to be around us because the Spirit's living in us. They need to, they need to experience the love and, and the grace of Jesus, Holy Spirit living in us and in our words, how we conduct ourselves and the things that we, we say. I think that's why it's so important for us to hang out with people who are not yet Christians, to, to have them in our homes and to go into their homes. I actually think it's a sin if you don't have friends who, who aren't Christians. Like, how many people in your cell phone's number do you have that you've talked to in the last month that aren't Christians? And if you, you can't think of one, you need to repent. I'm, I'm, not, I'm serious. Like, this is Jesus' like final words. Like, 
Like, you're going to follow him. Like, okay. A Sunday after church, we went to a pool party with some friends and um, some other friends showed up. None of them Christians. Um, and so one of the gals, we were sitting at a table and having some uh, food and, and, and drinks. And she asked me, she's like, oh, so what do you do? And I'm like, oh, here we go. And uh, so I said, I'm a pastor. And she's like, what is that? <laughs> and uh, turns out she'd never been, been to church at all. And so I just said, well, you know, um, I believe there's like a God and, and he loves people and he, he sent his son so that we might know God and be connected to him in relationship. And then that, then that would enable us to have real relationship with other people. I just think all of life is about relationships. So as a pastor, I just kind of tell people about that and trying to help people have good relationships. And um, she said, I like that. You know, I... Me and my husband, we actually don't really have any, any real friends, any real relationships. It's actually the first time we've hung out with anybody in a long time. She's like, so tell me about your church. I've never been to, to church. So I'm praying for her. Um, I mean, I was at the gym just the other day and I've been talking to this dude about Jesus that we spot each other sometimes on the bench when we're trying to get six packs. And, um, and uh, I invite him to our men's routine. He says, oh, I can't go. And just, just two days ago, he said, Hey, Duane, um, does your church have anything for kids, you know? Like, you know, we, me and my wife, we're, you know, we don't really believe in God. We think it would be good for our kids and stuff. And so I told, I send him the video about our church. And so he's checking out, says he's going to come. Um, the story we tell is that, hey, God is with us. <laughs> and God wants to be with you too. We've got to tell people that. We've got to tell them our story. Maybe you're here today and you really do want others to know Jesus and you want to follow his instructions um, to go out and tell people about him, but you just don't know where to start. Start with your neighbors. Like, get to know your actual neighbors. Invite them over. Have a party. Uh, your coworkers, hang out with them after work. Uh, just make plans and just see what happens because guess what? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is with you and in you. Like, he'll help you. He'll be all right. Don't got to be scared of it. He'll empower you. It's not on you to say the right things. It's just open your heart, open your home, open your mouth. God will use you. Um, the story that we tell is that God is above us, that God is for us, and God is with us. And by the way, when I, I'm actually leaving on, on vacation for a couple weeks, and Pastor Bus is going to be um, continuing a series through, through First John. When I come back, we're going to do a, a four-week series to try to help us with mission and getting prepared for the fall called Won't You Be My Neighbor? So um, that's going to be fun. We're going to do some doctrinal and practical training on mission so that I would love in this uh, next year, and I think this is actually possible for every single person who's a member of our church, and even if you aren't, if you just come in regularly, for all of us to, to bring somebody into the kingdom, to lead somebody to Christ, and you can do that. All right? That's our goal and our plan. Uh, okay. God above us, God for us, God with us, band's going to come up. It's really simply the story of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is above us, the Father. God is for us. He's shown us in the Son, and God is with us by His Spirit. It's a story that we need to tell and a story that must be told. So I started out a sermon telling you about this podcast. Dude, did you hear? Dude, did you hear about Jesus? Um, and I started telling you about Nickelodeon and its cheap, crappy TV shows. We end today talking about a far better thing than a show, a story, the best story of all, the story of all stories, a story that's so good that we just got to share it. I want to conclude by reading a section from my friend Justin uh, Buzzard's book. He's a good friend of mine up in San Francisco. I've gotten to know quite well, and, and he wrote this book titled The Big Story, um, and here's what he says. What sort of story are we in? Throughout the ages, people have given many different answers to this question. Your neighbors, coworkers, and local bookstore all offer different answers to our question, but they all believe the story that they think makes sense out of their lives. My conviction is that the only one story is, is that only one story is big enough to adequately answer this question, to explain all the beauty and all the brokenness we see in the world, to make sense of our desires, dreams, and disappointments. The big story. The story we need is the old and ongoing story of the Bible. It tells one big story about God and his people. It's a strange story. It's a good story. It's a complicated and challenging story. It's a thrilling story. It's a story that's still moving. A story in which you play an important part.
The part we have to play is to share the story. That's our part. The only question is, who are you going to share it with? Who are you going to share the story with? You've got to share the story.